procedure and to make it a lot more student-centered because it's a great way for students to, um, to reflect and become aware of their own learning, but also for teachers to reflect and become aware of their own teaching. Okay. That's very interesting. So for some of you, you're wondering what is formative, what is summative. So I won't um, keep you hanging any longer. A summative test or assessment is there to evaluate students' learning by comparing it to some benchmark. I'm going to evaluate if you are intermediate or advanced. I'm going to evaluate if you are B1 or B2. Very often this happens at the end of some kind of course, like a midterm exam, a final project, um, and there's some kind of, fi it feels final. Summative exams, summative assessments often feel like it's the end of something. Now, if you look at achievement tests, there's something quite summative about achievement tests and certificates. So yes, I would agree with uh, Kamaljit, summative for achievement and certification. However, if you're looking at helping students to learn, helping students to develop, like the last point on the slide, uh, helping teachers to see how effective they are, helping to diagnose where are my students now and how does this information help me to plan the course? I would say these are more formative assessments. So what is a formative assessment? It is some it's, it's, it's a way of identifying the student's strengths and weaknesses. It is a way of recognizing which students are struggling a little bit, which students need extra support in certain skills, so that you as a teacher can then address those problems perhaps through your course planning or perhaps just through your day-to-day -day class management strategies. And these, I would say, are formative. It is helping to form the teaching process. It is helping to form the course that you are planning and carrying out. Now, why did I say that is a trick question when I said, you know, which of them are both? Because to be honest, many of them can be both. In my opinion, summative and formative are kind of a mindset. If you see a test or an assessment as the be old end all final thing, okay, I've done a test, it says you are up intermediate. So there you are, right? Um, Ali is up intermediate and I put that in my head, that's done. I know that now. That's summative. However, if the mindset is, oh, okay, the test says Ali is upper intermediate, but his writing seems to be more intermediate, and perhaps I need to work a little bit more on his cohesion to help bring his writing to upper intermediate. That is formative. Because I'm using that information from the test, from the assessment, to help form or formulate how I can better support that student or even how that student can better improve himself or herself. So a lot of summative tests can be used in a formative way. We can use the results of a form summative test to help inform us how we can then continue to support the students and continue to help them progress. Yes, Ramona, absolutely. Learner feedback and development is, is very formative because we're talking about developing. Yes, and at the end of a course, at the end of a term, we might choose to give them a summative test to say, okay, right, this is a summary, if you hear the word summative, it's a summary of what you've done so far and how far you've got. Now, earlier I asked you how you all have been doing and um, your teaching circumstances uh, and many of you said that you are moving from an online teaching into face-to-face -face, or at least preparing to do so. Some of you are preparing for a hybrid blended 
kind of learning as lockdown starts to ease a bit in certain countries. Now, I find this picture very amusing. If you have any ideas why I think it's amusing, please feel free to use the chat field to tell me. But very often when people talk about working during a lockdown or distance learning, online learning during a lockdown, the kind of pictures we see often looks like that. Exactly, Eski. Very comfortable looking, cup of drink in the hand, you know, a comfortable couch. <laughs> Anna, you hit the nail on the head there. No kids, no chaos, taking things easy, relaxed, happy. And this might be true for some people because the lockdown experience is so different depending on your circumstances. For some of my friends who are single, young and you know, perhaps ha they have a, a fairly relaxing job. Lockdown can mean boredom. Lockdown can mean, oh, I've got lots of time on my hands, so I'm just going to take up a new language course. I'm just going to start sewing. I'm going to start learning to draw. However, for some of us, lockdown and working and learning during these chaotic times, it's a bit more like this. <laughs> Katarina, you say that's more realistic. This, this would be my reality, me trying to work. Uh, I have three children, exactly like this picture shows, except my three, three children are actually younger than the ones in this picture. And working and learning can be absolutely a nightmare, trying to juggle everything at the same time. And this is the same for your students. When you're learning and teaching online, the situation might be slightly different from face-to-face -face classes. For some students, getting to get online, see their classmates, learn some English, might be fairly relaxing and easy to do. For some students, perhaps like this lady in this picture, if she's online learning English with her kids jumping around on the bed in the background. Exactly. It is the art of concentrating. Thank, thank you, Kamaljit. It's difficult to concentrate. It is no wonder that over this period of a lockdown, we see students with very, very different experiences moving in very different directions with their learning. The term COVID-19 slide has been coined. I did not coin this term. So what is COVID-19 slide? Have you heard of this expression? So what is it? It is the potential impact of school closures on students' academic achievements. Pre-lockdown, pre-COVID-19, researchers and scientists have already noticed that during a summer break, during a holiday, an extended holiday for a month or two months, students have been found to slide so that when they start school again, they have kind of regressed a little bit in their abilities and skills from where they stopped school. And this is no surprise to all of us teachers, is it? You know, a, a student stops reading for two months, of course his reading skills are going to be affected. A student stops practicing his English for two months, of course his interaction abilities, his speaking abilities, his fluency will decline. And of course to us teachers this is absolutely no surprise. Of course apply this to COVID-19 where the disruption happened over longer than a course of a month. Students have been at home for three months, four months. Although there might be online lessons in the background, they might not be able to concentrate in the same way that they could in a face-to-face -face class. Here's a graph 
to show you what the COVID-19 slide looks like. Now, this is a graph looking at primary school students, so it doesn't apply to young adults, but I do think that we can learn a lot from this slide.